Hello everyone and welcome back to AMOS, our course on Agile methods and open source software. This is the second section of uh, the fourth part of the course uh, on planning and tracking. We are discussing product management or technical product management and specifically the scrum role of a product owner. And in the previous uh, section of this fourth part we discover covered the basics and now we will look at planning, different types of planning horizons, the tools, the processes and activities associated with it and uh, also tracking how you're doing with respect to the plan and then naturally, this is agile, uh, adjusting the plans in accordance with something you will learn about how things are playing out. So. Planning, well, it's hard. Here's a software developer. I'm almost ready. Let me guess, even more almost than yesterday, much more. So point being, planning is still hard, agile or not. And also almost, well, as the uh, saying goes, software developers always believe, there are 80 percent there. Never changes. Always 80 percent there. Of course, you want to be there 100 percent at some point in time. So, with that, let's talk about planning horizons. We are not letting go of planning. We just have different horizons with different certainty of achieving the goals. As you all know, we do sprint planning. So sprint planning would be for a sprint. So that's one horizon. Here you can see the basic structure coming top down for a product, for a market. Uh, you will have to develop a roadmap that could be for years even. And even if you think that's not agile, well, you still have to, need to have a roadmap. So whatever way you do it, you cannot let go of it. Within a roadmap, you do release planning. So you structure everything into releases, uh, which are product or project releases here and can be something of the size uh, a year, half a year or a quarter. Usually in Agile, you also make them shorter rather than longer. And then, of course, you do sprint planning. So that is your weekly, bi-weekly, monthly uh, increment of work that you do, the sprint, and you have to plan that and that's what you've been doing in the course all along. Within that, uh, you do feature planning that is left to the software developer to structure how they go about their work during a sprint. So that's not product owner work. The colors here indicate that one, two, three is a job for the product owner mostly and feature planning number four is a job for a software developer in Scrum. Here you can see it laid out nicely, how it all breaks down. You have uh, the roadmap at the top structured into a sequence of product releases or project releases, and then each project or product release being structured into sprints, which have their own substructure, our PE3R, structure of planning execution, review, release, and retrospective. And sprints are of the size one to four weeks. Project or product releases are of the size six to 12 months, and so forth. So um, as discussed then, the roadmap is, roadmap is a sequence of releases. A release, a project or product release is a sequence of sprints. And a sprint is that short time box, that short iteration where you get commit to work and get it done. So naturally then you have to ask, well, if there is a goal uh, of getting something done, uh, how do we know we got it done? So you need a definition of done and one uh, where you agree on what it means to be done before you do. Let me come back to that, that in a second. 
So the definition of done is uh, an app definition of done is an auditable checklist of results that are obviously value adding, business value adding. And these are orthogonal to acceptance criteria. So typically they are about the non-functional aspects of what you're doing. Acceptance criteria are tied to a specific feature. So in the Telefriend feature, an acceptance criterion is that the email is being sent to a Telefriend, for example. That's specific to the feature. That's an acceptance criterion. A definition of done is non-functional and applies to all features. So it would be something like the code for the feature, given that we're talking about features here, the code for a feature has to have 80% test coverage by unit tests. That is something that's not specific to a feature, but can be applied to all features. Typically, it's a non-functional property that makes up or constitutes or is part of a definition of done. What makes sense or what is important for definition of done is that you sit down as a team and agree to it before you put it to work. There's no point in changing a definition of done as you face adversity. The purpose of a definition of done is to maintain a certain quality level and if in the face of challenges in the project you water down your definition of done, well then it lost its purpose. It's supposed to hold you uh, to a bar that you define, hopefully a high bar, and ensures quality that way. So the team, meaning the product owner and the developers, have to agree on a definition of done. And that may be some tough discussion as you, well, are obviously going to hold your feet to the fire if you're not going to make that definition of done. But then not only do you need to agree to it, you also need to apply it and use it. And that is uh, dependent on what type or what level you're talking about. So definitions of done exist on three different levels, at least. You can talk about the definition of done for a single feature, like uh, the 70-80% test coverage you want for that particular feature's code base. Then for a sprint release, where maybe you say a test, uh, you need a test coverage of 90% or so. No, So you would go up from a single feature. Maybe you make a single feature 50% and a sprint release 70% and a product release then 80%. Meaning as the topic at hand, the work to be considered done gets more important, so a single feature if you fail, all right, a sprint if you fail, hmm, not great, but can happen. A product release, ideally, you do not fail. So you increase, actually, the definition of done, where uh, you thereby increase the quality of the result. Uh, just because you pass a definition of done doesn't mean you didn't fail. If you just have a so low bar for your definition of done, um, your product release may just fail upon first contact with a customer even if you declared it done. So the point, of course, is to have a definition of done that ensures that if you say it's done, it really is done. So um, you need definitions of done for these different levels. You can see this in the planning documents where you can document the DOD for uh, these different levels. So for a single feature, it could be something like unit tests uh, have been written up passing, code review was done, so there was always a sign-off by another person, and so forth. Um, as I mentioned, really make sure that you don't confuse definition of done with acceptance criteria. The DOD for a feature is the same for every feature. You cannot and should not vary it while the acceptance criteria are necessarily specific to that backlog entry. You will be adding definitions of done for these different levels over time.
Well then, as you perform the development process, uh, sometimes you run into external constraints. In an ideal world, you just chug along with regular sprints of the defined size. You become a steam engine, a regular repeating sprint output churning machine because the idea is that it's predictable, getting more and more predictable, and the pattern is always the same. That would be a regular sprint of the regular size you have defined for it, like a week or two weeks. It can happen, of course, that uh, there is a variation in time because you're facing a specific externally imposed event, like there's a fair coming up. Uh, you have to get something done and you need to fit it into the very last moment. Of course, you hopefully you don't have to, but maybe you have to. So you extend or make the sprint length, uh, the duration fit the real world schedule of external and the event being imposed events being imposed on you next to a regular duration or variation in duration you can also vary what the sprint is about so in a regular sprint you usually pick up new functionality and implement it in an exploratory sprint you would argue that or you would decide that you want to focus this sprint on exploring a technical risk, for example. So you know you have to use, uh, uh, you know that you could use a new library that will make your life easy, but you're not sure about its quality yet. So you would benefit greatly if it was stable and easy and good to use, and then you should switch to it. But maybe that's not where it is yet and you should wait another year until it reaches the quality you need. So rather than make a one-time decision and not uh, be able to revert it, you might want to explore the use of that library in one sprint. So you use exploratory sprints to, well, explore something like get information about a technical risk or a business risk associated with software development so that you get the information to make a better decision on how to proceed and so you can view that as an exploration and the output uh, might mean that you throw away the code if you learned what you wanted to learn because the purpose of the sprint was not churning out code but gathering information you could have a cleanup sprint maybe you did let quality slide a bit you shouldn't but maintaining that Always same quality level of coding and code quality can be hard. So maybe bugs kept piling up. And so you need a cleanup sprint where you focus on raising the quality of the software. So no new functionality, just cleaning up the software. That, of course, may lead to a fight between the product owner and the software developers because usually the software developers want time to clean house uh, have a tidy up everything while the product owner who may not see the code on a daily basis will usually argue well we need new functionality we want to keep our customers happy so nobody sees the code uh, except you and you're not the customer and so forth so there's all kind of variation of why you might have different types of sprints etc so, as I said, you can have different durations, one week like in Amos or two weeks is more common in industry, all the way to monthly sprints, though I think they are less common these days. Um, for shorter sprints, you should start in the middle and end in the middle of the week so that the learnings from finishing the sprint will be fresh in your mind as you start the new sprint. It's less of an issue if you have long duration sprints. And then you adjust it to context like that expo or that fair coming up and so forth. In class, there will be some quizzes we can discuss. All right, so uh, in terms of scope, we are still on the sprint level. So we are focusing on the smallest 
scope or time horizon for planning of the team that the product owner is involved in. And planning for a sprint, well, that is the sprint planning meeting. It should be prepared properly so that it will proceed and will be successful. Uh, it would be bad if the sprint planning meeting fails because you will miss a beat, you'll go lose your rhythm. So during sprint planning, you have the product owner leading the meeting, explaining the features, and the software developers will estimate the features as explained in previous lectures. So here again, we have our little workflow for planning poker, where, where developers play a Delphi, well, play a game. It's really an Oracle or Delphi method. But the key again is that everyone gets a chance to think by themselves. And that's why everyone plays their cards independently of each other at the same point of time so that we actually get differences and get the discrepancies out on the table so that people have to communicate and explain. And then you do a couple of rounds until you reach consensus. And by now you may already have a team, team setup or a well-working team where reaching that consensus takes one or two iterations of planning poker and that's about it. So the product owner picks a feature, the software developers go a couple of rounds or just one or two rounds where they estimate the size and then the product owner writes down the size as a result of the agreement between developers, asks whether more features can be done and if so, or picks up the next feature from the product backlog or otherwise ends the planning meeting. After ending or during and after ending the planning meeting, the product owner manages the sprint backlog, meaning moves into the sprint backlog, the new features, annotates them with the size so that at the end of the meeting or shortly thereafter, there's a nicely defined sprint backlog containing the features where the developer said, that's what we can achieve. And that's what we commit to achieving as a team until the end of the sprint. So the sprint backlog has this limited size, meaning a couple of, uh, a couple of entries that will get done or that the team commits to doing, and that's it. It's different from the product backlog, which is this open-ended list of upcoming features with no particular time or planning horizon attached to it. The sprint backlog, despite the name backlog, is quite different in that it has that time frame associated with it. What's in there is expected and supposed to be done within that one upcoming sprint. And you know you're done if you have a definition of done for your sprint and you fulfill it. So during sprint review, you use the feature level definition of done to check up on every feature in addition to the acceptance criteria and decide on whether the feature was finished or not. For the sprint as a whole, and that's then the sprint release, you have a different set of definition of done criteria that have to be fulfilled for you or for the product owner to say that the sprint release is done so that the current code base constitutes a successful release. And that may be additional criteria to what the feature level definition of done contains. In general, they are similar, but you tighten the screws. You get a little bit more ambitious with the sprint release because well, the sprint release is more important than a single feature release. So you may add things that are just not relevant for the individual feature, like the database, cons uh, database checks run consistently or something like it, or deployment to test uh, to a test environment succeeded with certain criteria and so forth. So another quiz for class. Then, 
since we are talking about the planning horizon of sprints now we will i would now like to define what's called velocity or speed of development and if you are getting the hang of it as a team and you're churning out sprint after sprint and you're getting into the rhythm then you will notice how what you commit to every sprint has in the sum of story points roughly the same size if your estimates are any good so you can see how there's a certain complexity of work you can get done every sprint and since sprint is a time uh, unit of time uh, we can now measure the speed of development as the number of story points you get done every sprint so story points over sprint high school physics speed equals distance over time and now we have a measure of speed and we want to use it first we have to track it so the product owner calculates by adding up the total number of uh, story points that the team regularly manages to do in a given sprint and then maybe they chart it so here you see a chart for it so it's first sprint was 21 second sprint was uh, 23 third sprint was 21 again fourth sprint 24 points so that looks like it's uh, roughly somewhere and you can see here in the example over a longer time horizon how well it's uh, what what's the average sprint size here like 22 or 22.5 um, you can put an average in here and then you know around that number is what you can get done in every sprint this does not mean that you always uh, must have more or should be should have less it's what you have what feels right to the team and is probably if you achieved this constant constant pace of working uh, near that near that average development speed value so um, if you have a bit more then it may just work out or one feature doesn't get done if you have less well not a big problem either you can maybe pick up the next highest uh, and you finish early you just pick up the next highest feature from the product backlog the point is you do what needs to be done or can be done within the available time and you'll get a curve for the velocity or the development speed like this and then we will use it quickly or in a bit so now uh, we talked about sprints and we know that the sequence of sprints add up to become a project or product release again it's the product owner who is supposed to be planning it it's not really part of the scrum definition um, because it doesn't talk about that but you need some sort of product release if you were really lean and really agile maybe there's only continuous delivery where every second you can possibly deploy and there's no quality difference between sprint releases and project or product releases but certainly with student teams uh, there is a quality difference usually and you will have to make extra sure for the product release that it meets your definition of done and general quality criteria so that release plan is again um, what you can get done for a product release and so it's the features over a series or sequence of sprints like the sprints ideally the releases have a certain rhythm to it so they should also be time boxes much larger than sprints but should be time boxes of equal length but that's not always the case it really depends on the context um, as we will discuss in one of the quizzes changes are most likely to be imposed onto you by external factors outside your control if you have full control yourself the better usually in a 
client-specific project, you get more external constraints, while in a product for a market, you have a bit more control yourself. And so the release plan coincides with the release schedule, and so multiple releases one after another will become the roadmap. More on that in a few slides. So here is how in overview in a spreadsheet a release plan could look like. It's actually for two product releases. Um, at the top is the first product release, like a midterm release for you for the Amos project and a final release at the bottom for the uh, for the um, uh, total uh, for the final release of that product of the project. So uh, you can see how for each sprint we list the user stories and the predicted size of that sprint by adding up the uh, sizes of the individual user stories. And then we calculate something which is the burn down where for the whole release we burn down the total amount of story points across all sprints in that release uh, plan. We burn it down from the total amount that's outstanding at the beginning down to zero at the end when you finish the last sprint of the product release. The reality, of course, is that's never how it's going to work, but I'll come to that in a second. So again, um, release is a sequence of sprints and it's basically a self-similar system because releases are also sequences of releases are similar to how sprints are sequences of sprints that fit into one release. So as explained, a single release plan is a value business value generating or providing product increment for the market a sprint may not be handed out to the customer, though ideally it could or should, but certainly a project or product release will be put in front of the customer and even be put into a production. The release plan, like the sprint or sprint plan or sprint backlog, is for communication purposes usually, and so precision varies or doesn't have to be super high is certainly not used for contracting. Like you had a definition of done for an individual feature and for a single sprint, you now have to have a definition of done for the product release. And yet again, you increase the expected quality. So your test coverage should go up, documentation should be there finally for developers and for users and what have you. It depends on your specific project. Now then, as you plan a release, as you plan beyond the individual sprint, as you try to estimate where you will be at the end of a product release or even at the end of the whole project, uh, like the Amos project, you look ahead, you plan out the sprints and again you add them up and then you can visualize them to generate the so-called burn down chart. Now, I'm not sure that the burn down chart is used broadly any longer. It was a staple of agile planning for the longest time. So I teach it so that you know what it is. I'm not sure its actual practical use is so high any longer, but it is a nice visualization of where you expect to come in at the end of a, uh, of a product release cycle. So you can see on the x-axis here the sprints and you can see how at the beginning of sprint one, it's maybe 110 story points are outstanding. At the beginning of our sprint two, 90 story points are outstanding. So what happened is that 20 or 21 uh, story points were finished in sprint one and the number of outstanding uh, story points decreased, meaning you are working towards the product release goal of getting all the features done that were listed in the release plan. And sprint after sprint, you do your work and reduce the number of outstanding features and thereby the number of outstanding story points. And ideally, ta -da, 
after sprint five. Um, so maybe this is a sprint a five sprint product release. Uh, you finished everything and you're down to zero, meaning you fulfilled zero story points, meaning you fulfilled your release plan. In a bit more detail, so maybe not five sprints, but let's make it 12 sprints or so three month product releases. You have much more variability. You do have a well-working team in this example. So we know we do about 20, 22 uh, story point sheets each sprint. So we know 12 times 22 is the total amount of story points you can do in that product release. And so you lay it on, put down into the product release plan all the, all the features that, add, that are most important and that add it up, uh, give you give you these uh, 12 times 22 story points. And so in this uh, illustration here, we are at the beginning of the product release. Work has not yet started, but the product owner has planned it out. The predicted burn down from a total of 268 user story points to be done down to zero um, uh, after after sprint uh, 12. So um, on the left you see the numbers, on the right you see it charted out. And then reality kicks in. So you have an actual size that you achieve. Maybe it's a bit more complicated than you thought. So you track the actual size. That's why we track the actual size and we see it's a little bit lower than what expected. So Maybe that's just how the team estimates differently. More likely, maybe work is, was a little bit uh, underestimated. So you can see how we are at sprint uh, before sprint eight here, finished sprint seven, got 19 done in sprint seven rather than 21, and got 17 done in sprint six rather than 24, etc. So we are lagging with respect to the original plan. Now then, uh, there's no shame in not being able to predict the world correctly. This is just agile. You know you will be off. So no problem. What you do though is you adjust the release plan. The product owner after every sprint uh, goes over the release plan with the new knowledge gained from the most recent sprint and adjusts and adjusts the release plan. So they not only add to the product backlog, they also um, groom, so it's called grooming. So not only do they groom the product backlog, they also manage the similar information in the release plan so that they can see that now with more certainty about the actual development speed and hence the capacity for maybe a total of 235 story points to be done in a given product release, they will achieve uh, a bit less uh, and they will plan it out. And the reason here is that as the team progresses, as the team progresses during the product, uh, through the product release, sprint by sprint, they will um, um, get the work done and the product owner will get more certainty as to where they will land. The whole purpose of having this product release plan and charting it out, visualizing it through this burn down charts is to see where you will be, what your point landing will be like at the end of the product release. At any point in time, the product owner who manages and maintains the product release will be, say, will be able to say, based on current knowledge, this is what we will, can give you, dear customer, after uh, the product release or when the product release is being shipped. And it could be a bit more than what they promised at the beginning. It could be a bit less than what they promised at the beginning. And then finally, uh, on top of planning an individual product release, or maybe two individual product releases in Amos, we chain those releases into a roadmap. Arguably, two releases already make a roadmap, though 
a roadmap is not so much a project planning uh, mechanism than it is a product map planning mechanism. So you may have noticed how I say project or product release depending on whether you do a client specific project or a product for a market. Uh, when you talk about a roadmap it's almost always about a product because it's open-ended. So the roadmap comes in two sizes. One is the external roadmap that you communicate to external stakeholders, so your customers, the market, and then a more detailed internal roadmap that you uh, use for your internal planning that you communicate to internal stakeholders like um, sales and marketing or, or the CEO. So the product owner has to maintain these two roadmaps and arguably the external roadmap is a, um, is a view or a reduced view on the internal roadmap. You want to commit usually to much less in the external roadmap than what you say in the internal roadmap because changing uh, something that you didn't promise to customers is much easier than <laughs> changing it if you actually promised it. Because customers make their own, uh, own decisions based on what you communicate to them. So here you can see maybe at the top is just this sequence of events when you plan or suggest or promise maybe even the date when you will release something and then you just have a list of bullet items for example what that new functionality will be that you release on 1st of April 2014 on 1st of October 2014 and 1st of April 2015 and so forth. The internal roadmap then has much more detailed information uh, typically but corresponds of course in terms of key events like the delivery date with the external roadmap. The internal roadmap could have intermediate releases as well. And so again, the product owner or maybe more strategic product manager is responsible for the roadmap. Scrum really doesn't tell you much about it. Um, again, an external roadmap would communicate different things. There are certain patterns in industry that you will quickly observe. If you're a startup, you go through alpha, beta, and eventually a general availability release of a new product. Well, even large companies go through that for a new product. And then you go version by version, minor version, major version. These are names applied to different levels of change in the product. So minor versions uh, are usually just incremental refinements while major version changes may indicate uh, substantial architectural changes, different behavior and what have you. And so again, you get different levels of, uh, of uh, planning, uh, different people responsible for it and so forth. So the Scrum product owner as a technical product manager is responsible for planning a product release or we make them responsible for planning a product release even if Scrum doesn't really have much to say about it and it's comparatively short term so three months or six months and you use epics and features and if you have a well working team with some predictability in how they churn out code you get some certainty in that you will achieve it. Now, beyond the individual release, there is the strategic direction. If it's a product for a market, there is a product roadmap or there should be a product roadmap. And that's the job of the strategic product manager. It doesn't really exist in Scrum, but they create that product roadmap because this is determined by how the business believes it can take advantage of the opportunity in the market that they see for this product. And that has a time frame of one to five years associated with it or is managed by themes and epics. And naturally, the further you go into the future, the less certainty there is that this is exactly how it will turn out to be. Longer term, beyond even the product roadmap uh, for the next few years, there has to be a product vision, which could be much more far reaching than just the product roadmap. And so that's either driven forward by 
a very strategic product manager or a business uh, owner of a large business unit in a large company or even the CEO maybe in a startup. Somebody needs to be the holder of that product vision consisting of high-level ideas of a better world thanks to your software and obviously achieving that has um, has risks associated with it. I don't want to say certainty is low, but it comes with its risks. So while we just looked at planning from the time perspective, meaning the longer the time horizon, the different, uh, the, the more you use different techniques, so short-term sprint planning, mid-term release planning, longer-term road mapping, This applies from the organizational perspective to a single product or a single team only. Now, what about if you have multiple products? If you need to coordinate a product line uh, or a large product portfolio, a family of products that are somehow related. There could be lots of interactions on a technical and on a business level. On a technical level, it would be frameworks they all rely on. On a business level, it would be cornering a certain market, what have you. Now, Agile doesn't have to say anything really about it, or at least this original Scrum work doesn't say anything about it. Most common, I think, is scaling an organizational scope is simply by traditional quarterly and annual planning, uh, having quarterly goals for the department and for the whole company, having annual goals for the department and for the company. It really is not Agile. So that is breaking with what Agile is trying to achieve. I expect to have uh, guest speakers from industry in the second half of this course who will talk about uh, safe and less and scaling Scrum. So maybe I hope I expect to get some additional perspectives on how you could go beyond a single team, a single product uh, that you're trying to ship. So with that, uh, we talked about planning and tracking in Scrum. Uh, we tied to different scopes and time horizons and organizational scopes, uh, the different activities. We introduced definition of done, not to be confused with acceptance criteria, and reviewed some of the key activities. Went from sprint planning through release planning to road mapping. And that's it from me for today. This concludes the second section of the fourth part. And after this, we move on to software development, engineering management, software development, and so forth. Thank you for your time and attention, and see you in the next lectures.